Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Well, given the eternal consequences that Jesus is speaking of, wouldn't we want to know about this sin and avoid this sin? Now, about this sin that our Savior is speaking of in the Gospel, it would be helpful, I think, to have some background for understanding. Now, in first century Judaism, the people were taught, except for Christ Jesus, of course, his teaching, they were taught that sin against God brings guilt and disaster. Guilt and disaster. What kind of disaster? Well, for example, do you remember the uh, account of the man born blind? That's a disaster to be born blind. And the question that the apostles ask is, who sinned, this man or his parents? Or the Tower of Siloam, which collapsed and fell on 18 men, crushing them. It was automatically assumed by all that the reason that this happened, that the tower fell on these men, is because they are worse sinners than anyone else. So sin, disaster always went together. So that caused most people to want to repent and seek forgiveness. And how did they do this? Well, by offering sacrifices in the temple, by giving alms to the poor, by praying long and fervent prayers for pardon. Well, it seems all right, doesn't it? That's kind of, sounds almost like a Lent sermon there. But we need to listen up here because this is very important. Forgiveness could never be assured. Forgiveness could never be assured. You did your best, hoping that God would be merciful, but there was never any kind of a guarantee, let's use that word. So we can see then how startling Christ Jesus' assurance of divine pardon for sinners is. They didn't know what to do with this guy. Well, we know what they ultimately did. Become my disciples, Jesus says. Be assured of freedom and forgiveness and eternal life. Even his enemies knew what he was teaching and preaching. You say, meaning they're speaking to Jesus, you say, if anyone keeps my word, they will never taste death. The issue is, is they just didn't believe him. They clearly understood what he was saying, but they just did not believe him. That's a promise that's being made. And as we just heard, they didn't think there was any kind of promise. There's no assurance when it comes to God. So they ended up being more and more self-righteous. Here I can prove that I'm worthy of God. And I'll show you by my self-righteousness because I keep this law and that law and keep it perfectly. As the Apostle Paul said, as to the law, perfect. So God is offering, Jesus says, free pardon, forgiveness of sins, assurance of the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life to anybody that has enduring faith, Everyone that is selfless and loving in their actions, that is empowered by the Holy Spirit at baptism, regardless of their sin, regardless of their past. So in Christ Jesus, God's forgiveness 
God's flowing flood of forgiveness, of grace and mercy is coming upon the world. All could be forgiven. All can enter the kingdom of heaven if they repent and follow Christ in the new and righteous life in him. None would be excluded if they would respond with repentance and endured with Christ to the end, as Jesus said, those that persevere to the end will be saved. Okay, so then, why is one sin declared unforgivable? Jesus' own words. And what is this sin? I hope everybody knows already. He plainly says the sin of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, which is also the sin of rejecting Christ as a blaspheming deceiver. The religious leaders saw Christ, they saw his miracles, they saw exorcisms, they saw healings, they even saw people being raised from the dead. And they couldn't deny the reality of these. They were there in front of them. They can't deny them. So what do they do? Well, you either believe or do what they did. He does this because he's in alliance with the evil one. Notice they can't even say his names. It's only my Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Their spite, their loathing, they can't even say his name. Do you know why they can't say his name or don't want to say his name? His name, Yeshua, means God is our salvation. Your name meant something then. So is this just kind of slander or is there something more going on? Isn't this just kind of blasphemy against Jesus? No. It's blasphemy against the Son of God. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. They're declaring that the Holy Spirit, through whom Christ Jesus performs the miracles, is an unclean spirit. In this, they're setting themselves against all God is doing in the world. They are rejecting Christ's arrival here on earth as deception and fraud. But the reality still remains that they ignore that Christ's kingdom alone brings truth and life and love and grace and forgiveness all flowing in to this world, bringing eternal life to those that are interested. So that by continuing to reject the kingdom, to reject Christ, they are rejecting the only source of true forgiveness. Are you with me? Okay. This one old saint wrote, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was not unforgivable in the sense that God refused to forgive those who repented, but because in persisting in this sin, they cut themselves off from the possibility of forgiveness. Jesus is not simply another Jewish teacher. He is the everlasting son of the Father, so that to see him was to see the Father. And to reject him is to reject the Father. So rejecting Jesus as demonic cuts a person off from forgiveness. For this is rejecting God as revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Gospels and all the great saints of the church proclaim the same, calling the works of the Holy Spirit a product of the evil one, 
is therefore calling evil good and good evil. And this can't be forgiven. Why? Why? Well, let's look at this a little bit more. See how this might apply in today's day and age. And in fact, this does happen. When someone accepts the Old Testament, but rejects the New Testament. or those that accept the Old Testament and the New Testament, but they don't accept the saints or the holy mysteries of the church, the sacraments. This leads to people making choices. The word for choice is heresy. You've probably heard that word before. This leads people to make choices or heresies to add or subtract from what Christ has delivered to the church, meaning all heresy is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You're rejecting or accepting according to your own desires. Again, we read from an old saint who says, condemnation comes upon all those who deny that the gifts of the Holy Spirit continue always within the church. Yet it's always possible to draw near to God through repentance. For such, no sin is unforgivable or eternal. Yet stubbornness in one's heresy, making up their own church, is unforgivable. Also, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is blaspheming against the Holy Trinity. So if you don't acknowledge the entire Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then that person is blaspheming, yes, the Holy Spirit, but also the Son and the Father. Also, some people would say, and there's some uh, denominations out there that have problem with the Holy Spirit. They have a problem with Jesus. They reject the Holy Spirit as divine. They re reject Jesus as divine. So if you make any statements or decisions and choices to persevere and refuse that there's the eternal origin and glory and power of the Holy Spirit and his only begotten Son, this is the blaspheme again, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What about something else? Well, if one falls away from the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, this is blasphemy, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. An old monk, his name is Elder Paisios. Uh, if you get to read his stuff, it's, it's wonderful. He was asked what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. This is what he said. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is in general disregard for the holy and sacred in the church, provided, of course, the person is sane. We even blaspheme the Holy Spirit in how we approach the Holy Eucharist. Do we look upon the altar and say we are going to receive merely a morsel of bread and wine? Do we question whether or not this bread and wine is actually the body and blood of Christ? For those who do say this is the body and blood of Christ, do we approach this holy mystery in a manner befitting of God, as in being in love and charity with our neighbors? For St. Paul says, for one who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to him or herself, not discerning the Lord's body, meaning the church. Therefore, and this is interesting, therefore it is impossible for blasphemy to exist in a devout and faithful, repentant person. 
Are you still with me? He further says that impudent people who justify their fall into sin in turn justify themselves and the evil one, thus committing a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and opening themselves up to demonic attacks. Such a person never enters into God's grace and rest at the last, for impudent people are the first level of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's people that are heretical, people that are making up their own church, their own God, their own Jesus, their own Holy Spirit. Impudent people are the first level of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Those who despise and scorn the sacred and holy are the second. And the third level is the evil one himself. So that's where the religious leaders had Jesus in that last category, the evil one himself. This then means that blasphemy goes hand in hand with stubbornness and pride. It's often said that blasphemy is the child of dreadful pride, which brings and fosters disobedience to God. I think we talked about that last week. So if you will not, and you choose not to obey God, there's only one other option. There's either the kingdom of light and life or the kingdom of darkness and death. The kingdom of light and life is infinitely more powerful than the kingdom of darkness and death, but there's only two kingdoms. There is no neutral ground. That's just made up poppycock in this age that I have this section of my life that's neither good nor evil. It's just what I say it is. It's never been that way. Jesus never said that way. The scripture doesn't speak of that, nor do the saints. So you choose to obey God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or you choose to obey the evil one, who then swells up with pride in himself when we disobey God. So to this, Christ Jesus speaks, as do all the prophets. One word starts with an R, ends with a T. Repent, repent, draw near to God, receive the assurance of God's forgiveness, healing and victory over sin and death. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Be watchful of disobedience in yourself. Be watchful of blasphemy with the eye of your soul, your noose. Be watchful and repent, but do so before death comes, for after death there's no repentance. And don't put this off, because death comes unexpectedly. Well, the gospel lesson today is very often misquoted, and I've fallen into this myself in the past. The typical misquote goes like this. If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, God will never forgive you. If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, God will never forgive you. That's not what Christ Jesus says. You got to read the scripture, but you got to read what's there. Verse 28, what does he say? All sins and blasphemies will be forgiven. So why does he mention then that there's one that will never be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. Remember, he's responding to the Pharisees who say that he's casting out demons by being the greatest of the demons himself. That's who Beelzebul is. The Pharisees, they're looking at God with us. They're watching God with us perform miracles. And they are clearly stating this, God did not do these miracles. God was not present in these miracles, but the evil one is. 
That's what they're saying. And the sin that we're talking about, that Jesus is talking about, the sin which the Pharisees commit is turning away from God, ignoring God's presence. A person is able to cry out to God for forgiveness as much as they desire to do so. But if the person denies God, if the person turns their back on God, they can't receive forgiveness until and unless they turn around, which we call repent. If a person denies God, makes up their own God that they haven't received from the church, from Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition, if they're heretical, if they believe this and that and the other thing according to their own wisdom, they can't receive forgiveness until and unless they turn around, until they repent. So where does that leave us this morning? Do you have any fears or concerns that perhaps unbeknownst to you, you may have committed the unpardonable sin? I hope you do, because most likely you have not committed the unpardonable sin. Those who have committed such sin have no regret. They have no conscience about their sin. They believe that they are good. Do we not hear this every day? Hey, it's all good. It's all good. Good is what I say it is. They have no interest in forgiveness of God. They don't think they have anything that they need to be forgiven of. It's okay to go call good evil and evil good. And I decide what is evil and I decide what is good. The unpardonable is the only sin for which people do not ask God to forgive them. That is, when people stubbornly reject Christ Jesus and his gift of eternal life, to the end of their lives. So it's only at the end of one's life or the return of Christ that someone can be called a blasphemer of God. We might blasphemy God, we might blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but we're not a blasphemer until the end of the age or we drop dead and we're unrepentant. Are we still on the same page? Okay, so anyone who seeks the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the church to become aware of their sins and sincerely repents of his or her sins and asks God for forgiveness will receive forgiveness. That's the reality. The reality is, is that no human offense and sin and blasphemy is beyond divine forgiveness if we are willing to repent. Amen.